day. So today, um, as you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in our environments, and I'm, uh, I should introduce myself, um, Ken Field Griffith, CEO of Ajua. And what we are putting together is a session and a few sessions about how do we thrive and stay alive as businesses moving forward within a certain, certain time. And we as a duo, we believe we have a, a responsibility to bring um, certainty to some of the issues that's happening. And for us, that's the relationship between you as a business and your customer. How do you drive certainty with that relationship? And today, we have none other than Richard Owen. Richard Owen was um, CEO of Satmetrics, and Satmetrics are uh, the co-creators of Net Promoter Score, NPS, which is used by a thousand, over um, 14,000 com um, companies around the world. And a little background about Richard. Richard, Richard has been in tech for a while, um, and very modest, but um, <laughs> been in tech for a while, whereas he, uh, first, the first marketing, mobile marketing platforms the um, event go and went public for a billion dollars. And then after that, he was also an executive um, supporting Michael Dell at Dell Computing, actually designing the supply chains and actually pushing um, products to customers. And then after, subsequent to that, um, started um, uh, CEO Statmetrics, which they, they um, co-created Net Promoter Score. And today, Richard is going to talk about, you know, just the environment that we're in as far as extreme circumstances and how you navigate it, spe specifically focusing on your customer. So without um, further delay, I would like to introduce Richard Owen. Richard Owen, um, full disclaimer, is also a board member and investor in Ajua. So that's why we're able to get his time. <laughs> so, so thanks, Richard Owen, for um, putting on the session today. And, and welcome, everyone. So I'll hand it over to Richard. Thanks very much, Juan. Can you can you hear me loud and clear? <clears throat> well, yes, you can. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody, and and warm greetings from the western part of the United States of America this morning. Uh, thanks for the generous introduction, Ken. When somebody says Richard's been in tech for a long time, I think that's a polite way of saying he's quite. Uh, but uh, it's certainly. Uh, certainly uh, interesting, dramatic times we live in right now. And I'm sure, like myself, you're bombarded with people who are putting emails in your inbox saying how to deal with X and Y and Z uh, in times of challenge and crisis. Uh, and when we do these uh, research thought leadership pieces, our primary objective is to be original. We don't want to give you something you've heard somewhere else. That's quite a challenge because lots of smart people are writing on the topic. But Hopefully we'll give you some new ideas to think about or take a different look at some existing ideas and give you some, uh, some food for thought. So without that, let me sort of dive in straight away and start to, uh, start to give you a sense of how we're thinking about this. So first of all, brief agenda. I'm gonna really talk in sort of three topics. I'm gonna talk a little bit about a framework for thinking about customer experience. And the only reason I do this is because it's gonna give us a foundation for thinking about how to deal with challenges. Um, and we're gonna move through that into a three phase model that I hope has you thinking differently about how to manage your businesses and how to respond to these kinds of challenges. Now, I, I did this presentation several times, as you can imagine, and some of the feedback we got on it was very interesting. The first thing people said was, Richard, you only have one idea here in the entire presentation. And so why do you spend 30 minutes talking about one idea? And I think this person actually had a very good observation. There is only one idea here. And I would like to start perhaps by telling you what that idea is. And then we can kind of get into the details. And the idea is very simple. Society transitions to some sort of new normal state. Now, the length of the time it takes to get to that transition and what that new normal state looks like are all uncertain items for us. Everyone's challenge in customer experience, and for that matter, most business operations, comes down to answering two simple questions. One is, what's that new normal going to look like when it arrives? And how do we as a business establish a strategy for delighting our customers in that new normal. 
Now, that's quite a different sort of frame of reference than how do we respond today? And I'll talk about the distinction a little bit. But our challenge as business leaders is not necessarily to solve the most important pressing item of today, or as, as Ken would put it, the survival phase. Our challenge is really, in some ways, to lead our organizations through to a, a future phase where things thrive. And so, if, again, one idea I'd like you to take away from this is you need to ask two questions. What's the new normal going to look like for your customers? And how are you going to be successful in creating delighted customers, promoters, if you like, in that new normal environment? So let me talk a bit about the framework a little bit, which might help you think about this. Uh, in North America, certainly, I'm not sure so much of a debate elsewhere preceding the crisis there was a lot of conversations around a concept called stakeholder capitalism. And stakeholder capitalism was talking about the idea that maybe we shouldn't be as concerned about shareholders anymore. Uh, if you think about it, most modern capitalist enterprises have not just a fiduciary responsibility, but a strategy to maximize shareholder value. And many people question whether or not that should be the sole purpose of the enterprise. Should we care about other stakeholders? typical stakeholders being employees, customers, of course, are stakeholders, community are stakeholders. Well, I find that as something of an ironic debate because in practice, almost every single business that's successful, I would argue, already practices stakeholder capitalism. In fact, I would go as far as to say that you can't practice shareholder capitalism without practicing stakeholder capitalism. Well, what do we mean by that? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, in almost every successful business, and I'll define success here as growth and profitability, there is essentially a balance. There are three groups that are completely aligned in their interests. The employees of the organization have a sense of common purpose with the customers of the organization and the shareholders of the organization. And think of it this way, if any one of those three groups isn't aligned, how can a business function successfully? If the shareholders aren't aligned, the company isn't making the required levels of profits or creating the right customer lifetime value economics, shareholders will sell the stock or they'll force changes in management. So that's not, not an equilibrium. If employees aren't aligned, employees can't delight customers, and furthermore, you get higher levels of employee cost, employee attrition, so that's not going to be stable. And if customers aren't aligned, we already know that if customers, if you don't have a lot of promoters, if you don't have a high NPS, it's extremely unlikely you can grow your business or achieve high financial performance. So customers need to be aligned. So when you have common purpose and a balance, if you like, between these three groups, you have a fundamentally successful company. And I would go as far as to say that there are no examples I've discovered of corporations who are successful financially who don't have some kind of balance in existence. There is an exception based on monopolies. So if you're in a monopoly business, not a competitive business, then these rules sort of don't apply. But in competitive businesses, they apply pretty much all the time. Okay, so that's sort of foundational principle. Um, and the reason that's important is because what's happening in a time of stress is that that alignment, that sort of agreement, if you like, between all three groups becomes extremely stressed and breaks down. And so what happens is, as you can imagine, the first thing we tend to notice rather superficially, perhaps, is shareholder performance is damaged. Right now, the Standard & Poor is about 12, 13% off it's high in January. Well, that's actually a big recovery for it. If, if you're watching that, you'll see that at some point it was as low as 30% decline. And we experienced one of the biggest declines in a short period in the history of US stock markets. So enormous stress on shareholders, but also at a personal level, employees are suffering loss from a whole variety of reasons. In many instances, employees will lose jobs. At the very least, they lose job security and potentially they also see the value of their pensions decline. They may see cuts in salaries, um, all kinds of impact on employees, I think we could all agree. And finally, 
And perhaps the more focused part of this conversation is, the most important thing for this conversation, I would say, is customers lose alignment with the company. What the customer thought they were getting from their vendor, what they wanted to get from their vendor changes. And their priorities and how they think about their vendors changes. So during instability, all these things change. The most obvious cosmetic is shareholders, but at the same time, your customers are changing dramatically. So at a macro level, as I said, one big idea is you're seeking that new equilibrium. You're trying to figure out what will it look like in the future? What will our employees want that's going to be aligned with what our customers want, that's going to be aligned with what our shareholders want? Let me make it a little more practical. Shareholder returns are going to decline this year uh, in all certainty. Shareholder expectations for next year are going to be revised. So you're not going to have the same set of shareholder expectations. Uh, employee expectations are going to be revised. Employees aren't going to have the same degree of expectations. In recessions, which is almost certainly a byproduct of the, uh, the epidemic, uh, the pandemic, I should say, is in a recessionary environment, employee expectations change. A lot of employees who might have been quite prone to switching jobs a year ago will be delighted if they can secure reasonable, secure, uh, secure employment over the next year. And so their priorities change. And of course, customers' expectations change, which is the most interesting area. So our challenge as leadership is how do we find what is a new balance? And it helps to think about this occurring in sort of three phases. The first phase is a period of extreme volatility. And that's what we're living through, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm sure we all experience this at a very visceral level. And by the way, we have about a million years of evolution that explains how to handle extreme volatility. It's called the flight or fight response, right? We have all kinds of emotional reactions to this. We have elevated stress levels. We've got a very primitive brain that basically says there's stress, there's risk, there's react. Our priorities change dramatically. In fact, our ability as humans to think long term is severely impeded in times of stress. We become very, very short term thinking. And so during this phase, there really isn't much strategy going on. There's reaction, the survival instincts kicking in. And at this point, Nobody knows what the new rules of the game are. It's impossible to predict. Furthermore, we're not even thinking clearly about them. We're simply trying to react day to day. So this period is the first challenge. Once we get through that, we establish this new normal, and this is a period of stability. So whatever it is, it's no longer got that extreme volatility. We start to think longer term. We start to stabilize. We adapt. And we're an incredibly adaptive species. No matter what we think is stressful, it's not as stressful as we think it's going to be when we adapt. You know, I was on a conference call the other day, and the, uh, the executive said, and this was an American executive, said the most, in, the most amazing thing I've seen during the coronavirus crises was the, was the presentation from Her Majesty the Queen of England. And I said, well, what? that's interesting. What do you th find fascinating about that? And he said, Queen Elizabeth started by talking about the presentation she'd given to the nation in 1940. And she was able to contrast 1940, a world at war, with today. And my reaction to that was, first of all, it's amazing that anybody was making speeches to the public in 1940. Uh, she was a, a young woman, 15 years old, I think. Uh, but also a reminder that people are immensely adaptable. On a challenge of that magnitude, human beings coped, they adapted. I don't believe, and I sincerely hope, that we're not facing a magnitude of uh, challenge of that order, but we, should, we, we will move, we will transition into this new normal. It will happen and it will be stable, and it's likely to be an area characterized by a return to growth. There will likely be, like in every recessionary environment, a period of accelerated growth as economies recover, followed by a period of stability. I know it's tempting to think this time it's different. It's probably not. 
And then finally, we get into this long-term performance. And I'm not going to talk a lot about really long-term. What I would encourage us to do, and I'll touch on this, is think about 10 years from now and think about what letter we would write to our earlier version of ourselves saying, gosh, here's the things I wish you'd done differently 10 years ago. And actually, now we think about the 2008 financial crisis, which is just over 10 years ago. And you look back at it and say, what mistakes did I make 10 years ago? And what would I do differently? Um, and so that's an interesting frame of reference. And the reason I suggest that as an exercise is because of the fact that right now we find it so hard to think long term. Uh, but if you're a bit more abstract about it, if you project yourself 10 years forward and say, what are you probably going to tell yourself? You're probably going to tell yourself the world did return to normal. Growth did resume. You're probably going to tell yourself the companies that were most successful were those that anticipated that, planned for it, and adapted quickest to it. So it's easy to talk about these phases, but bear in mind two things. One, nobody can really anticipate these transition points except in hindsight. We look back and we say, oh, I, I know when the 2008 crisis ended and the recovery started, but only in hindsight. In, at the time, you, it's very hard to spot these transitions. So we know they're going to happen, but we won't kind of realize they've happened until it's actually occurred. Uh, that doesn't stop us preparing for them, and the best prepared companies will take the best advantage of it. Well, let's touch briefly on this current period of extreme volatility. So what happens in phase one? Well, society is painfully aware there's a transition going on. All rules have changed. Individuals and businesses become very short-term focused. Profitability drops. Companies may rush to cut costs. What's important to understand about expectations is they drop dramatically. Customer expectations change very rapidly in a number of important ways. But customer expectations in general drop. Remember that net promoter score is actually relative to expectations. So if expectations drop, what it takes to create a promoter drops. And this teaches us two important things. First of all, comparison with prior periods isn't going to be very useful. But also, the customer equation for creating promoters, passives, and detractors is going to be very different today than it was even two months ago. Your customers simply aren't who they previously were. When it comes to consumers, and it's important to remember this, in business to business, the people you're dealing with are people first, companies second. So everybody is kind of like a consumer right now. Your business is not that important to them. Unless you're providing health care or food or security, you're just not that important. What seemed important a month ago has been pushed down the hierarchy of needs. The context of the customer is very fluid. They don't know what's important. And so B2B businesses lose ground to B2C. Look, if I can't feed my family, if I'm worried about my health, I'm not sure I care how much about my accountant. The customer's products and services get judged against different expectations. And within the journeys you deliver customers on, things shift in priority. Let me give you a very simple example. About two months ago, if a vendor, if I'd gone online to order a product and that vendor had said, it'll take me three weeks to get you the product, I'd have said, that's insane. There's no way I'm waiting three weeks. That's completely unacceptable customer experience. Now I go, great, you can get me the product, three weeks. I'm thrilled. I'll take it. My expectations have changed. Now, six months from now, I'll be back to saying, 48 hours for delivery? Are you crazy? So expectations move quite substantially. We also see an introduction of moral judgments. Look, right now, there is, a, you know, there is an enormous moral pressure on businesses to behave well. Not all companies do. In the United Kingdom, certain sports goods retailers wouldn't close during a time when it was in everyone's best interest for them to close. That was a moral judgment that consumers will apply very harshly to those businesses. You're being judged not just on regular business rules. You're being judged, are you doing the right thing for society? The two largest vaccine manufacturers in the world today have decided to collaborate instead of competing. 
that's the right thing to do, but also reflection the fact that the rules have changed. We're now under much more moral pressure. Finally, remember that under periods of stress, consumers remember experiences much more profoundly. Those of you who are fans of the peak end rule, which basically says people typically remember the high points of experiences and the last thing that happens to them. Well, stress means we remember things much more profoundly in those peaks. How you treat your customers under periods of stress will live with them much longer than how you treat them in more calm periods. What customers above all want to hear at this moment in a crisis is they want to hear, we are all in this together. They want to believe you as a vendor are in it with them. There's a sense of shared purpose and sacrifice. Going back to my example of Queen Elizabeth, what characterizes periods of war is in sense that nations come together. They bring themselves together as a group. And people expect that from you as a company, and they are unforgiving if you don't follow that rule. Well, what happens to Net Promoter Score? Well, I've already sort of given you the answer. Because Net Promoter Score is designed to capture data really on the extremes, promoters and detractors, um, and we somewhat ignore passives mathematically, uh, you're going to see more extremes. Uh, you're also measuring against different expectations. Uh, so the data you gather today, if you see it going down, if you see it going up relative to the data you had six months ago, it doesn't mean anything. You can't say you're better or worse. Expectations are completely different. So you can only look at data now in the context of the current situation. We rely over time when we trend data on a belief that somehow expectations change slowly, which is generally true. But right now, they're not changing slowly. So if you're going to keep doing surveys, bear that in mind. You're not going to see, you're not going to see necessarily comparable results. You're going to see response rates drop. Why? Responding to surveys just isn't the most important thing for people right now compared to uh, other mechanisms. Um, <clears throat> so also worth remembering that when you survey, you're communicating with customers. And so it's critically important that you think of this as a communication exercise. I'll give you another practical example. Shortly after we went into lockdown, I got an email from an airline that said, you know, you're falling short of your frequent flyer numbers for the year. You should really fly some more. I thought that's an odd email to receive because we're not really encouraging people to fly. Now, the problem was this was a campaign that somebody had probably set up three weeks earlier and no one had switched off. But as a consumer, I might not necessarily draw that conclusion. I might draw the conclusion that that business is just crazy and only cares about its bottom line. If somebody sends me a survey saying, you know, uh, how do I feel about the product or service? Would I recommend them? I could react to that by saying, what are you crazy? You're asking me about this at this time? It's just not that important. Whereas if I get an email that says, listen, we understand right now that things are very different and we're here to help you. And it would be immensely helpful to us if you could give us feedback, but please understand, you know, we're not here to be pushy about this. We respect the fact that the situation is different. My reaction to that's very different. These guys understand. They're with me on this. We're in it together. So you need to be very careful. First of all, before you do anything, stop until you have a plan that takes account of the current environment. Most big mistakes come from companies on autopilot. They're just doing something because they've always done it. They don't stop and change. Secondly, they react too quickly. They overreact. And watch out for those wheels in motion, that email saying, you know, keep flying. That's not the message that people want to understand. You and I may know it's marketing automation. Your consumer may just think that you're tone deaf as a, as a company. So remember, surveys are communication. Remember, at the best of times, there are bilateral communication. What do you want to say to customers in a time of stress and crisis? Yes, maybe you want to ask them for feedback, but you certainly want to say something beyond just, hey, your feedback's important to us. Sure enough, but maybe at this point, we want to be very careful. So communication needs to change. You need to make very deliberate steps. Don't be on autopilot.
Okay, well, let's move, let's move past that phase because we should all at this point in the cycle be thinking about the new normal. And new normals, I know an overused phrase, but it's a good one we all sort of understand. So what characterizes this next phase? Well, in a word, stability, but not the stability we enjoyed a month ago or two months ago. In all practical circumstances, the stability we're going to see is one of global recession. Different rules apply. Growth will resume. Profitability will be much lower. Individuals and in time horizons start thinking of the future. That's good. But the rules are now going to be apparent. Expectations are going to firm up. One of the most important things to remember is if you're reacting to that instead of planning for it, you're too late to capitalize on the opportunity. The most successful companies have a plan for the new normal. They know how they're going to delight customers in the new normal. They're putting that plan into effect now so they're ready for it. By the time it becomes apparent to you, you're behind your competition. Maybe one in 10 companies is going to really, really do well in this new phase. And without exception, they'll be the companies that anticipate, plan, and lay the groundwork for it. Those who react will be too slow. So what happens in success is you reevaluate your CX strategy. Typically, companies find customer acquisition is much harder, whereas customer retention becomes much more a priority. So customer lifetime value equations change. Companies stop directing all their assets towards how do we get more new customers, and they start redirecting assets to how do we make sure that we are retaining and developing our customers. Um, portfolio thinking becomes important. What I mean by that is, and I'll talk briefly about that, is companies focus more. They look at business decisions through a tougher lens. Is this a good business to be in? Well, it might look like a good business a year ago, but maybe we can't create successful customer relationships in this business. Our customers over in this business product line don't really love us. We're going to focus on the areas where we can create great customer success and we can grow the company. Resources are more scarce. We need to be more efficient. The biggest challenge we all face is that the work we've been doing on customer experience up to this point is now coming home to roost. This is a tough one because for many companies, it's a little too late to build great customer relationships. That's work they should have been doing for the last few years. The reason I raise this is not because I've got a solution to that problem. I can't wind back the clock and tell you, go and build a great NPS two years ago so you're ready for a recession. What I can suggest to you all, and it's an argument for leadership, there will be another recession. There will be another crisis. The biggest lesson you should take away from this one is that companies that went into crisis or recession with high NPS will do better than those who went in with low NPS. So your challenge as leaders in customer experience is to convince your management that they need to start preparing for the next recession. The exact wrong response is to say, we need to cut back on what we're doing for our customers because we're now in this recessionary environment. We don't know whether another virus or black swan event or recession is three months away, six months away, or 12 months away. We know that there's never a bad time to build this shock absorber, this relationship with your customers. And so the last thing companies want to be doing is failing to learn the lesson of the past. So what do I mean by portfolio thinking? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, here's a very simple technique. At the end of the day, think of profitability as a backward-looking measure of success in a company. Think of net promoter score as a forward-looking predictor of success in a company. What parts of your business, your geographies, your product line, um, what parts are succeeding in both dimensions? Those are the parts of the business you're gonna focus on. What parts of the business are not succeeding are the ones where you're gonna down prioritize because you don't have the luxury in a recession of taking on businesses where you can't delight customers and achieve profitability. This is a prioritization technique. By the way, some absolutely brilliant companies, and we don't have time to go into it today, have applied this technique exactly like this, very successfully. Simple, 
but powerful way of management to think about organizing their business focus. Another way of thinking about this, this is a model came out of Harvard Business School, is to think about customers through how loyal they are to you, which indicates their future value. It's not quite the same as NPS in the Harvard model. It's very similar. And how expensive they are to serve. And one of the things, and again, we, we, in the video, we can go, go into this a little bit more, uh, but one of the most entertaining aspects of this model is why would you do business with a high cost to serve low loyalty customer? Well, Daz Nariandas, who built this model, used to joke that we call these customers strategic customers. And I asked him, why are they called strategic? And he said, because whenever I ask them, what possible reason do you have for doing business with these people? They say, well, it must be strategic. Um, there's no, it's a joke, of course. There's no logical reason to do business with a customer who has high cost to serve and low loyalty to you. And yet there are probably many companies that are like that in our customer portfolios. Please understand that in periods of recession, as a company, you have to choose who you're doing business with. This may sound counterintuitive because we need all the customers we can get, right? That's not actually true. Bear in mind that companies become the customers they choose to serve. It's such an odd concept to think that we choose our customers, but we do. And when we choose them, those customers shape our business because we want to delight them. If we choose the wrong customers, we're going to shape our business the wrong way. And the right customers are not to put too fine a point on it, customers who we can create enormous loyalty out of and will be enormously profitable for us. If they don't meet those two criteria, they're not great customers for us. And in a time of recession, we can't afford to do business with companies that aren't going to meet that standard. You're all very familiar with customer lifetime value models and journey models. Well, the only point I'd make on journey models is the journey changes. Different things become important. When companies look to cut costs, the smart way to cut costs is take away things that customers don't care about. Well, how do you know what customers don't care about? Well, that's your analysis. That's your MPS, your CX journey analysis. Now, it will have changed, so you perhaps might need new data refreshes, but the customers are pointing the way to where smart costs can be reduced. Companies that aren't as smart cost, cost, uni cut costs uniformly. They say, how do we take 10% out of our cost base? Well, that's not very intelligent because that often impacts vital areas for customers, and that will cost more in the long term for the business than it saves. In fact, it might cost more in the short term than it saves. But companies that understand where the leverage points are for customers can say, we're going to preserve these things because they massively impact long-term customer behavior, and we're going to remove these things or cut cost over here because they're not that important. It's relative trade-offs. So we make smart cost-cutting decisions. And the answer for that smart cost-cutting is in your CX data. And leadership needs to be looking at cost reduction in the context of customer impact. And bear in mind on what I just said, in the context of which customers you're going to serve. So even though cost cutting is likely inevitable, you can do it very smartly. And CX data can play an integral part in making those choices. In fact, think of the alternative. Imagine a company that says, we're going to do cost reduction and we're not going to do it with any reference to how our customers will perceive those change in services. Why is that a smart strategy? Sadly, in the last recession, somewhere in the order of seven or eight out of 10 companies did just that. And that really is a shame for us as CX professionals. We aren't doing the job we should be doing in persuading executive leadership that they should be thinking differently about it. And most of the time I spend in, in our business is talking to senior leadership, trying to persuade them to think differently about cost reductions in recessions. Because at the end of the day, we have to make the case. And if we're not arguing for smart thinking about cost reduction, we're not doing our jobs as CX professionals. So I'll wrap this presentation up with this last thought about the future. And I hope you find this an, almost an optimistic uh, perspective because I firmly believe that in every scenario we adapt. 
that, adapt, uh, that adaption process can be challenging for us at a personal level. And that's not to diminish any of the suffering and challenges that we all go through in these periods, but we adapt. And 10 years from now, I truly believe we're all going to be in a much better place. And we're going to be looking back and reflecting on this. And the future version of you is going to write a note back saying, boy, here's the things I wish I'd have done differently. And I believe that the most important thing we will reflect on is that the businesses that anticipated what the new customer environment was going to look like and built towards it are going to be in better shape than those who didn't. Good example is digital transformation. As you can imagine right now, there's a flood of activity around building online digital assets. Well, frankly, for many companies, that comes too little too late. They should have been building those five years ago. What's, what's the next set of digital assets that companies are going to require for the next recession? What I would write a note to myself and say is, first of all, I should have been thinking about what the transition to digital would mean for my customers a decade ago. I should have been thinking about this a lot earlier. I should have been anticipating how customers were going to react in the future. Of course, I couldn't anticipate coronavirus, but to some extent, coronavirus is simply accelerating trends that have existed in our society for a long time. And I should have been preparing for that. And it's there in the customer data you have. So think about what you would tell yourself 10 years from now and act on that. Think longer term, get out of this short term mindset. So I'll conclude before I ask questions by uh, wishing that you're all in the best possible health, hoping that you take good care of yourselves and others in this period and you stay safe and hoping that you take away from this, hopefully a few ideas for thinking about customer experience and this data in the future. So thank you all very much. And now we'll, uh, we'll take some questions. Thank you very much, Richard, uh, for a wonderful uh, uh, presentation and discussion. Um, so we've got, uh, we'd like to ask everybody, please just put your questions in the chat group. Uh, so we're able to just read them out uh, clearly. And I'll start with uh, one question from my side as we wait for more questions to come out, right? So I'll go to Richard's question after that. So Richard, assuming there's a couple of us on this call that maybe had a CX strategy, but we didn't have the digital side of it, right? So the digital side of getting the feedback in. And therefore, unfortunately, uh, we don't have historical to go with. Uh, how do we survive during this period and prepare for the phase two that you just spoke about, right? Because we have to survive today to have actually have a phase two as well. So how do we do that? And then um, the next question is uh, from Rich, uh, which is basically asking, um, the new, new economies and businesses are being created during this crisis, of course, digitally, right? Is this temporary and what's the pedagogy around this? How should we position ourselves for these kind of opportunities? Just those two questions and then we'll take up the next one. Really, really interesting debate on digital. Let me ask the first question first. It's not really a CX answer. It's more a general business observation. Look, the reality is in a short-term crisis, companies switch from focusing on profit and loss to focusing on balance sheets. And ultimately, the strength of balance sheets dictates whether companies uh, survive or, or fail. Uh, there's not much that, to be honest, we can do from a CX perspective that affects that immediate survival instinct. Um, it, it if, if companies are in healthy balance sheet situations, they're in a position where they can weather the storm in the short term. If they're not, they need to find access to capital or they need to get their P&L in shape so they can survive it. It's very hard to do anything other than that in the very short term. That's, that's the unfortunate reality. Remember, when we're dealing with CX, we're dealing with futures. We're really dealing with how customers are going to behave in the future. In a crisis survival mode, there is no future unless you have a balance sheet that gets you through the next uh, six months. On the topic of digital transformation, um, you know, let, let, me, let me give you a thought on that. So in 1989, uh, I was running Dell.com, which at the time was the largest e-commerce operation in the world. And in 1989, uh, sorry, 1999, not quite so, so, so early, 1999, we were convinced that retail was gone. E-commerce was going to take over retail. And if you'd have asked us how quickly, we would have said five years. Well, we were directionally right, but timing wrong, which is very typical in technology transitions. 
And so what's happened with the coronavirus is we've had an accelerant on a long-term series of trends. Now, some of that will not stick. I think as people go back to socializing in person, people will not be using Zoom conferences as much to have Zoom happy hours and martini hours as much as they were, but it will still be much more than they were before. Some of those things have become social traditions that won't go away. Shopping online for groceries will accelerate. It will fall back, but it will still be at a higher level. So all of these digital trends have been accelerated. We, we shouldn't anticipate that a new normal will be as digital as we are today, but we'll be a lot more digital than we were yesterday because people are experiencing these digital products. Now, by the way, if some of these digital product experiences haven't been that good for people, if the first time you experienced digital grocery shopping was in the United States, at least, was the last two weeks, your experience with it wasn't that great. Um, but nevertheless, we know that the hardest barrier to change is getting people to try something once. The cat is out the bag. For a lot of digital products and services, that will change. I think we'll see a profound impact on long-term airline travel. We've been wondering about this for years. Uh, we'll see a profound impact on the use of commercial real estate. Uh, the notion that people are in offices all the time will change. And we'll see profound impact on how people shop for products and services, especially local products and services. Um, so all of those things will change to digital at a more accelerated rate. They just won't be as accelerated as they are today. Great answer, great answer. Um, so the next one is, uh, the next two I'll take uh, is from our, and by the way, just to everybody in the audience, please just type your questions so that I can read them out uh, uh, to reach it. So uh, the next two, so one is from Samantha. Um, it starts with a comment, and then the question comes right after. So, Richard, we couldn't agree with you more. We have been pushing not just smart, but empathetic cost reductions, but pressing some, I mean, pause on some surveys uh, per your LinkedIn article. I think that's pretty early on. Our question comes in. So, can you share some tips about getting leaders on board with looking at the long-term goal, not short-term commercials? Okay. So, that's the question. How do you get leaders on board by looking at the long-term? Then um, the next one is basically just a comment saying, hey, Richard, you know, we are encouraged that you're already tracking NPS on a different COVID dashboard. Um, this is the time presentation. So let's just focus on some of those questions about getting leaders on board by you know, on looking at the long-term good, not just the short-term commercials. So, I mean, a part of our communication strategy and clearly with the content we've created here, and of course, I think you're all aware, you can get copies of this material on our website. There's a video version of it that we created. Um, all with the goal of giving you communication tools to leadership. Uh, we spend right now a lot of our time talking to leadership teams on this topic. And I think the, the way we see most success when, when we are successfully persuading leaders, and that doesn't happen all the time, sometimes people are unpersuaded, um, is we frame this in financial and economic terms. We, we don't make this a a choice that, uh, for example, let me contrast that. I think going to leaders and saying, we should do the right thing for customers because it's the right thing to do is not a useful persuasion. First of all, you're boxing people in. There's no good answer to that. Of course, they're obliged to say it's the right thing to do, but nobody likes being boxed in by a choice like that. We make the case in financial economic terms. How is the company going to be delighting its shareholders a year from now, two years from now? What is the opportunity? We don't, we're not naive enough to try and make the argument that people won't cut costs. We argue for smart cost reduction. We argue for portfolio choices, which is smart cost reduction. So I think the wrong argument is to say, cutting costs is crazy. We should simply invest more in the future. That may not be practical for most companies. It's crazy to go and say to leaders, look, you should do the right thing for customers because it's a moral cause. That's a hard case to make. Make the case in simple financials and economics. It's focus, prioritize, and prepare for growth opportunities. And CX programs, because a lot of people are concerned they're going to get cut, uh, should be an invaluable source of data for corporations to use. The challenge is most CX programs 
haven't built the right data designs in the past and don't have the right data assets to make the compelling case. So it becomes quite hard for them. Clearly now you should look at your program and say, do we have the right data? Does the data tell a story that's compelling? Can we use that data to persuade management? And that's you know very much so sort of science of the data side. So <clears throat> I would encourage you to think about the financial and economic arguments. And if you have questions about that, we're happy to put more material together around that because that's really the focus right now. I know we're a little short on time, so oh, Gilbert, you're, you're muted there. Um, <laughs> All right, I, I'm, I'm back on, thank you. Perhaps, perhaps in the interest of time, I could just dive in and pick a couple of these questions on the chat to answer, because I know we're running a little short. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions by email, um, you know, uh, you know, later, uh, later in the process, if, if you're interested. Um, you know, there's an interesting question here about venture capitalists. Um, uh, VCs behave very differently and private equity companies behave very differently uh, than typically publicly held companies in, in these situations. What they essentially do is they separate their perceived winners from their perceived losers and they allocate their capital to the winners. So they perform triage with their portfolios. Uh, one of the biggest changes in the funding environment over the last decade is how much more impactful private equity is in the marketplace, not just by the way for startups, but also for large companies. Private equity is now sitting on enormous funds, which they are going to use very aggressively to acquire during this period and consolidate during this period. We'll see a lot of activity from private equity moving into the market with capital. You also see that with sovereign wealth funds. There was an announcement today uh, that, uh, or I saw yesterday, that Sovereign Wealth Fund, I think it was Q8, is making a series of acquisitions, amongst them uh, Newcastle Football Club, for example. But the, uh, the point being that you'll see capital resources being deployed very, uh, very aggressively like that. So VCs tend to triage, uh, and they tend to provide more funding for the companies that they think are going to survive, and they're willing to let those that they're not as confident around die because their business model is only one in 10 survive anyway. So why, why invest more aggressively? Um, there's another really interesting question here around uh, from Chelsea, uh, actually around uh, human interactions and a team's more removed from human interactions and empathy when considering customers. We did some really interesting research, uh, which we're publishing uh, we're in a, actually late stages of putting together similar videos and communication around, around in contact centers, how people react to um, AI, robots, non-human interaction versus human interaction, and what are the right tools and right circumstances. Um, and I'll, I'll net it all out for you in a very simple way of thinking about it. Um, you create higher levels of customer experience when you assign humans to tasks customers have that are ambiguous. So if you think about two types of tasks, friction reduction tasks that customers want to complete, you know, I want to make a change to a reservation, click, 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 or ambiguous question tasks people want to, I have, I'm not sure how to do this, I want to speak to somebody. In the former case, automation yields higher levels of CX. In the latter case, automation achieves low levels of CX. In the latter case, in ambiguous tasks, empathy, to Chelsea's point, becomes extremely important because the situation of the customer needs to be read. We also know that if you match personality types, which some companies do, there are certain types of human that respond well to certain types of other human in certain scenarios. And so the technique for handling that communication uh, in stressful, ambiguous situations is very different. The, the biggest mistake you can make is taking people who have ambiguous, stressful tasks and assigning them to automation. It, it, it creates instant detractors. Um, but there's much more, uh, much more work around that. I do think the rush to automation in contact centers, for example, will be mitigated by the need to provide much more selective support for these ambiguous 
human-centered tasks that do require human empathy. Machines can't quite fake empathy. And machines and artificial intelligence is very poor at solving highly ambiguous types of problems. They are machines at the end of the day. We're really not that smart. Um, yeah. So, Richard, uh, th there's two questions that touch on uh, CX strategy. So, if you just if I can combine them into one, certainly just ask them together. So, one is from uh, uh, Catherine Kriber, and the other one is from Bella. So, uh, Catherine basically is asking about how CX strategy, you know, will be important in the period of social distancing, especially in the retail sector. And uh, the other strategy uh, question from Bella is that. Uh, they are in the process of developing a well-defined CX strategy. Does institutional history play any part in this process, or do we simply focus on a disruptive CX strategy? Right. So maybe you can just combine those into one answer. I, I'm not sure I can, but I'll take a crack at I'll take a crack at both of those <laughs> interesting questions, both of which deserve a lot more of a comprehensive answer than we're going to give in the next few minutes. I'm afraid. Um, so in terms of retail. Uh, the reality is, I don't believe there is such a thing as retail anymore. Or more precisely, I don't believe there's such a thing as physical retail. There is now hybrid retail. Customer experiences are now digital, physical hybrids. And CX, the acceleration created by the virus, is only going to make that more pronounced. And so companies that traditionally segment, segmented themselves into bricks and mortar versus digital, there is no such thing. There is now simply hybrids. And figuring out the hybrid formula that delights the segment of customers you care about is going to be the most important CX strategy element. And a lot of work we do centers upon understanding the different hybrid answers for different segments of customers, mapping those segments against profitable growth opportunities so that that right balance can be struck. Let me make one other observation based on, as I said now, 20 years doing digital and online strategy. Um, every vendor who sells you digital product would like to explain to you that you should just buy more digital product. You should just go all digital all the time. That's nonsense. The reality is there is a appropriate balance and there is a design that's right for every customer based on its product services and customer segments. And nobody should go all digital. Look, Amazon, is building retail stores. There is value in every multimodal connection. The trick is finding the right strategy for your business in the, con in the context of competition, in the context of your products and services, and most importantly, in the context of the customers you serve. Um, a much bigger topic, I'd love to spend more time talking on, on that particular topic. Um, on the other question on, on, on CX strategy, um, which is about institutional history versus disruption, um, I think that the reality is for most companies, there are two swim lanes for executing long-term CX strategy. One is what we think of as being incremental, which is how do we continually improve our execution of CX strategy so we're getting better year after year. Um, one observation I'll make for you all is to get an NPS of 20 today and 20 next year, means you've improved. You've improved because expectations have increased and NPS is relative to expectation. Expectations keep increasing. So you have to pedal faster to stand still. You're going to have to continually operationally improve just to keep pace with the marketplace. Companies will do a lot of CX work around incrementally improving the most important aspects of customer delivery. And for large companies, that's a formidable task because you're moving thousands of employees and lots of transactions forward. The second swim lane is disruptive. And at the same time, a completely different thought process is required to anticipate disruptions in the industry. And there are several good techniques for that. We unfortunately in 30 seconds or so can't go into them all. But one thing I would encourage you to think about is a very simple trick. You get team members into a room and say, we're going to build a company that's going to put our existing company out of business. How would we do that? Well, let's think of all the things that we're vulnerable on, all the things we know we do badly, all the things our customers don't love about us. Could we build a new company 
that would actually fix all those problems. And remember, and this is my closing comment perhaps, one of the highest performers in the stock market today in North America is Netflix. Netflix was started because the founder, Reed Hastings, tried to take a DVD back to Blockbuster and he missed the drop-off time and he was fined an extra day. And he said, that's absolutely crazy. Who builds a business where your customers are punished like that? I'm going to build a business where nobody pays late fees on video. And now Blockbuster, probably most of you on this call have never heard of Blockbuster. It was a darling of the stock market at its time, and they don't exist. And Netflix is one of the highest value companies in the world. If you think that way about your business, who would put you out of business and how would they do it? Then you've got a blueprint for the business you need to become. You need to become that business. And that's a disruptive process. You need to do both, operational improvement and disruption. So I know we're out of time. I'd uh, love to have longer conversations. Hope you invite me back. There's a lot more we could talk about on this topic. It's a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard, uh, for a wonderful uh, session. And uh, definitely, we will invite you back. Uh, there's several questions that we were not able to, to, to put across to you today. Uh, we pretty much maybe bundled them into the early start of the next one. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. The session is recorded. Uh, if you do wish to have uh, part of that recording, do just let us know on email or on the chat, and then we'll be able to send it to you. But thank you very much, everybody. And uh, stay safe, stay home, and stay alive as a business. Thank you.